It's not working anymore, Jim. The kids just don't know about the Bomberman. We need a Bomberman for a new generation. Angrier. No, even angrier. Yes. Ship the game. <laughs> my career. Those damn kids ruined my career. Game series are usually pretty static. Madden is roughly the same game it's been for decades. Uncharted is Uncharted. Kirby's Kirby. But every once in a while, a game series takes a hard turn. Suddenly your happy, cheery Kirby is Angry Eyebrows Kirby. Game designers don't make those changes by accident. Something causes them. Maybe a big problem popped up. Maybe the series audience is changing. Maybe the game format is getting a little stale. Or maybe the designers just think that's the case. Whatever it is, something inside a game studio signals to the devs that the game has to change and go in a bold new direction. But what sorts of signals could those be? And more importantly, does a tone shift lead to success? Whatever success looks like. Let's look back at a bunch of game series that decided enough was enough, made a drastic change, and had to live with the consequences. This episode is sponsored by War Thunder. War Thunder is a free-to-play military vehicle combat game on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PS5, and the previous generation, and it's fully cross-platform. I've been hearing about how dedicated War Thunder's fanbase is, and I tried it out for myself. It's fun. I'm gravitating towards the aerial dogfighting. I love seeing dozens of planes in air all weaving around each other at once, and then taking a couple out myself. But if tank combat is more your thing, they've got like a zillion of those too. You can play with over 2,000 historically accurate tanks, helicopters, planes, and ships from every era in the last 100 years. You might even see me flying overhead in the same match. Click the link in the description to play War Thunder for free. There's a free bonus for registering too. You'll get a premium aircraft, tank, and ship, and a 7-day account boost to get started in style. Thanks, War Thunder. So, what are we talking about? A series only changes what they are because of a big problem. Sometimes the mechanics are the focus of the change, and we've talked about some of those in our Game Design Rebrands video over here. Other times, though, it's a problem with the series' tone and feel. But that could either be a real problem, or just a perceived one. Why does a game series try to reinvent itself? Well, there are actually a lot of reasons. Chapter 1. Always listen to the kids. Many tone shifts are business decisions, meant to try to widen the appeal of a series or to reach a new audience. In the late 90s, Naughty Dog was looking for their next big franchise after their success with Crash Bandicoot, but wanted something that they could call their own. They left behind Universal Studios to work exclusively with Sony, with whom they had built a strong working relationship during the PS1 era. With the more powerful PS2 hardware at their disposal, they saw new possibilities and set out to make their next big franchise, Jack and Daxter. Now, Naughty Dog isn't the kind of company to shy away from doing the trendy thing, especially in the 90s. Jason Rubin described Crash as following in the footsteps of giants like Mario, Donkey Kong Country, and Sonic, and the influence those games had on Crash's level and character design is pretty clear. Jack and Daxter would follow suit. The game is effectively a fusion and refinement of two of the most successful and influential games of the previous generation, Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Jack and Daxter was a 3D collectathon where players could explore open-world style sandboxes, completing objectives and platforming challenges to collect progression items like Mario 64. The game had an immersive story and cinematic components, with a fully fleshed out setting and better cohesion from location to location like what Zelda was known for at the time. The game had no loading screens, seamlessly loading the world as you walked through it, which helped contribute to the level of immersion the game was going for. Jack and Daxter was released in December 2001, to both critical and commercial success, selling over a million copies in the US alone. Though it wasn't nearly as successful as any of the games in the Crash series, and it wasn't for a lack of trying, Sony and Naughty Dog marketed the game hard. So what happened? Why didn't the game make a bigger splash? In hindsight, it's clear that Naughty Dog and Sony were aiming for as broad an audience as possible. The art style and character designs had creative input from Sony of America, Japan, and Europe. Jason Rubin describes it as a design by committee process that he felt was a mistake in hindsight. Jack himself lacked direction as a character, and likely lessened the game's impact to some degree. He was the silent protagonist, 
not doing much more than standing around while Daxter did all the talking and animating. The game had some minor but persistent criticism for lacking personality compared to its series contemporaries Ratchet and & Clank and Sly Cooper. The other thing is the industry was changing from under them. Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time were great, but it's 2001, baby. Tastes were changing, and refining what worked before isn't a guarantee it'll work again. Early on in the development of Jack 2, the designers were thinking through prototypes and the world they were trying to make. Jason Rubin talks of focus groups they ran, where young kids would say the game looked good, but, you know, good for their little brother. When Rubin would ask them what they were most interested in playing now, the answer would always come back, Grand Theft Auto 3. With the mainstream audience gravitating towards GTA, Naughty Dog took a cue from that and applied it to the sequel in as many ways as it could. Jack 2 was released two years later and flipped the basics of the original game on its head. The game begins with the main cast game flung through a portal to a harsh, war-torn city ruled by a tyrannical government and under constant threat of monsters called Metalheads. Jack is captured and experimented on for two years, completely changing his character. Also, he can talk now. Daxter is still here, still doing Daxter things. His wisecracks and jokey personality actually do a better job bouncing out the new edgy Jack than in the original. The plot casts aside the general fantasy setting for a revenge plot with guns and attitude. The collectathon structure has been abandoned in favor of story-based missions and a GTA-style open-world hub where you can steal cars and get chased by the authorities in between missions. The shift in tone was pretty jarring, but you know what? Jack 2 did fine. It was easy to make fun of its newfound attitude, but it didn't drive people away. Under that surface edge, the story was more engaging, the characters were more interesting and dynamic, the fundamental platforming gameplay meshed well with the new mission-based structure and weapons. Jack 2's tone shift was born out of trend chasing, and even though it might seem bolted on to a series that wasn't designed for it, the developers at Naughty Dog still pulled it off. The shift worked. Chapter 2. Scare the Kids Some series aren't trying to chase trends, they're trying to get ahead of stagnation. Take Advance Wars. Advance Wars is a pretty old series, but it might be older than you think. People in the West might know it first from Advance Wars, released in 2001, but it's way older than that. The Advance in Advance Wars refers to the Game Boy Advance, but the series goes back to 1988 with the Japanese-only release of Famicom Wars, released on the Sega Saturn. I mean the Famicom. Most Nintendo platforms had their own Japan-exclusive releases in the series, Game Boy Wars and its sequels, and Super Famicom Wars, but the big tentpole release was Advance Wars, big enough to cement what would become the series' hallmarks, a breezy but pretty deep military tactics game full of bright colorful scenes, wacky cartoon characters, and about as cheery a depiction of war as you're gonna find. Advance Wars sold great, even after releasing on the world's most unfortunate release date, and it spawned a couple of sequels, and a real weird spin-off on the GameCube and Wii. Battalion Wars is something. Over the next half decade, the series had fallen into a rhythm. A couple tweaked mechanics, an expanded story mode, and some extra multiplayer features, but Advance Wars was Advance Wars. Until 2008, out of nowhere, Intelligent Systems released Advance Wars Days of Ruin. Cheer? Gone. World? Meteored. Cartoony characters? Nope. Colors? Drab. Music? Sick as hell. Days of Ruin places the series' familiar tactical gameplay in a self-serious and stark world devastated by meteor strikes and the fight for resources in the aftermath. The game was a reaction to the perceived sameness of the series. The devs believed that the game was changing and evolving under the hood, but on the surface, it appeared to be the same game time and time again, and they felt that fans were starting to notice. The easiest change was to reflect the concept of war onto the rest of the game and unify the setting more. The world is wrecked. Pastel colors turn to browns and grays. Tsunamis, earthquakes, dust blocking out the sun. The COs have serious problems, rather than not knowing what an airport is for laughs. The COs aren't so much cartoon characters. They're fighting for their survival in a way the series never really attempted to touch on before. Days of Ruin's change in direction stem from a desire to stave off player fatigue in getting the same thing yet again. And it worked. Well, critically anyway. The change in tone was welcomed by reviewers and well-received by fans. 
Days of Ruin sold okay, but not great. About 600,000 units. Better than Dual Strike. They didn't even release Days of Ruin in Japan until five years later, as a Club Nintendo Platinum status bonus download. The series tone successfully changed, though the series has ground to a standstill in the intervening years. We haven't had a new Advance Wars game since 2008, and nothing afterward until Reboot Camp, the remake of the first two Advance Wars games was announced. Days of Ruin successfully revamped the series' style, though if they were aiming for lasting success, it'd be hard to argue that it was mission accomplished. Chapter 3. Never show your game to your co-workers. They will steal your ideas. Some tone shifts happen even before the first game comes out. Conker's Bad Fur Day was made by the Rare Rare team behind Killer Instinct Gold, but it didn't start out as a vaguely South Park-inspired 3D mascot platformer. First, it was a regular 3D mascot platformer. The game was announced at E3 1997, as 12 Tales, and followed in the footsteps of Super Mario 64, like so many other games of that era. Their one weird trick was going to be more expressive characters and animation. According to software engineer Chris Marlowe, 12 Tales had a ton of cool ideas, but they didn't really seem to gel together all that well. While in its early development stages, one of the other teams at Rare looked at 12 Tales and took inspiration, which they applied to their own Project Dream. That game went through its own shift, from an action-adventure RPG to something more colorful and platformy. Project Dream would be renamed Banjo-Kazooie. You might have heard of it. While Conker's development slowed to a standstill, Banjo-Kazooie was released in 1998 to massive critical and commercial success. That success would force the Conker team to do some soul-searching. Banjo made 12 Tales look redundant, just another cutesy platformer from Rare. The project stagnated, until it was taken over by Chris Seaver, one of the main artists on the team. The game needed a radical tone shift to make it stand out in the late N64 marketplace, so Seaver made it lean into lowbrow edgy humor while keeping the outwardly cute art style. Mix in some movie parodies because it's the late 90s, and hey, you've got something. Something more unique at least. Bad Fur Day was a product of its time, but the bold raunchy tone made it stand out among its contemporaries and was well received. Rare believed in it and thought the game had the potential to lead to more. After Microsoft purchased Rare, Bad Fur Day received a full remake in 2005 on the original Xbox with enhanced online multiplayer which remained fairly active for a couple of years. Weirdly enough, there was more censored content on the Xbox version compared to the N64 original. Rare had plans for multiple follow-up projects, including a full sequel, Conker's Other Bad Day, and a multiplayer-focused game called Conker Giddin Medieval. Though by this point, the revamp and tone already seemed a little dated. The projects never really got off the ground. So where does that leave Conker's Bad Fur Day and its tone shift? As a long-lasting series, Conker didn't make it. As a cult classic, it's still one of the better remembered games on the platform and one of the weird game development stories of that era. As a tone shift to save a failing outmoded project, it's hard to argue it was anything but a success. Chapter 4 Never listen to the kids. Remember Fuse? Nah, probably not. That's kind of the problem. Maybe though. And if you know about Fuse, you might know about Overstrike. Overstrike was first shown off at E3 2011. Insomniac and EA were teaming up to make a bright shooter where a quirky secret organization teams up to stop evil robots. No, not that one. That one. At the time, the game struck a chord. It seemed like it could be something along the lines of Team Fortress 2, with the added personality and individual characters something like The Incredibles. Jokey, special agent stuff with fun secret powers and near-future tech. Right now that might not sound too unique, but in 2011 it was fresh, back before every second game couldn't stop winking at the camera. Overstrike seemed like a totally solid concept and a promising title to check back on as it was developed. There weren't any public announcements, but that's not unusual. Everything's probably fine, right? One year later, we got a new Overstrike update. Uh, scratch that, not Overstrike. The game was rebranded to Fuse. Get ready for the zany, uh, huh. Where did all the colors go? And like, all the secret weapons are less fun and more disturbing? Turns out, the year of development kicked off with some focus testing. Insomniac was originally going for a fun, campy style, not far off from Ratchet and & Clank, and appealing to people in their late teens. 
Once it got to the focus groups, the target demo thought the game was for their younger brothers. So they changed it. That's a good call, because no game has ever been profitable if it appeals to 8 year olds. Ever ever. Ever ever ever. Ever 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 ever. The game went through a ground up reimagining and sucked the life out of the whole project. Every character went from quirky to tragic. Every motivation from rootable to unsettling. A game about personalities became about alien guns and the bad things you can do with them. From we're broken and having fun, to we're broken and not having any fun. Fuse came out in mid-2013 to tepid reviews, and guess what? They mostly harp on the game's lack of distinguishing personality. It's not a technical disaster. It plays okay. It's fine, I guess. But it's totally unremarkable. Fuse came and went. Chapter 5. I don't know. Do what you feel like, man. Tone shifts don't have to be dark and gritty or more epic or for comedy. Sometimes, it's about the vibes. Tetris is a puzzle game. Abstract, blocks, no story, no characters, just blocks. Fill in the lines as much as you can, level by level, faster and faster, until you can't. It's super simple, but there's one weird thing. If you play enough Tetris, there's a change that happens. You start playing the game by feel. You know where the pieces have to go without thinking about it. You're in that zone. A trance-like state where the line between you and the game starts to blur. You've experienced the Tetris effect. Now, that's by accident. The meditative qualities of Tetris weren't designed into it from the start, but it's a nice extra to make the game a little more compelling than if it weren't there. Now that it's here though, what if you leaned into that? There isn't much of a theme to speak of in Tetris, so what if you changed it to explore how deep the Tetris effect can go? Hank Rogers, founder of the Tetris Company, was a fan of Luminous and Res, and asked Enhanced founder Tetsuya Mizuguchi to do pretty much that, but for Tetris. The game was made with VR as a focus, leaning in on the experience of being fully immersed in the platonic ideal of Tetris. The road wasn't easy though. Tetris Effect took six years to create and refine. Early versions of the game were too overwhelming and out of balance. The studio tweaked the game to slow down the action while the environments were shifting around, to help give players the capacity to appreciate the visuals without losing the game. The campaign was split to provide more chances for breaks without forcing marathon sessions. But it was still just fancy Tetris. The gameplay needed a tweak to make the game its own thing. Every so often, you can enter the zone, which lets you drop blocks and fill in lines without them getting removed immediately. While the zone is active, you're trying to fill the screen with lines and then have them all clear at once at the end. The more lines you clear while in the zone, the bigger the bonus. The structure mimics the buildup and catharsis you see in music, and it's just as useful in games to help set the pace and create peak moments. And it worked. The game of Tetris becomes a skeleton on which the devs could project an ever-changing array of visual motifs and music that accentuate the experience without drawing your attention away. The set themes, animation, music, and zone mechanics let the game play with constantly shifting moods and create something worth experiencing. Now, the stakes for Tetris weren't that high. It wasn't like a series that could have been cancelled with a bad sales performance. Tetris isn't going anywhere. But the tone shift that Tetris Effect undertook created something rooted in Tetris, but miles past anything the series had done before. I hope you learned something today. If not, head down to the comments. Let's talk about other series that took a drastic tone shift, how they got there, and what changes you'd like to see your favorite series take. Changing the fundamental tone of a game doesn't guarantee success, but sometimes that roll of the dice pays big dividends.